Good morning, everyone. My friends, we're going to start in less than five minutes. So if I can ask you to please find a seat, that'd be very helpful. We've got a lot to do today, and we want to make sure to start on time. So please make your way to a seat. Thank you. Okay, we really are going to start in two minutes. If you don't have a seat, please find one. We've got empty seats at this table and this table and that table. Find one, please. Thank you.
Good morning, everybody. If you'd take your seat, please, I'd appreciate that. My name is Jennifer Salisbury, and I'm delighted to be here this morning. I am the chair of the Board of Directors of New Mexico First. This is our largest town hall that we've had in 28 years since Senators Domenici and Bingaman started um, New Mexico First. Uh, there are about 325 of you who are here, 190 participants, and you represent 31 of our 33 counties. So thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate it. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, some of the elected officials who are here today, um, including our speakers, um, and that is uh, our Senator Heinrich, who will be talking to you in a few minutes. But the uh, elected officials are Harry Antonio, the Lieutenant Governor from Laguna Pueblo, State Senator Gerald Pino E. Ortiz, State Rep Bill McCamley, State Rep Don Tripp, uh, Steve Batten, Mayor of Rio Doso, Sharon King, Mayor of Portales, Alfonso Ortiz, Mayor of Las Vegas, Jack Torres, Mayor of Bernalillo, Dave Venable, Mayor of Cloudcroft. Thank you all for coming today. We appreciate that. We also have staffers here from our elected federal politicians, uh, Congressman um, Lujan Grisham's office is represented as well as Steve Pierce's and Ben Lujan's office. So thank you all for coming today as well. New Mexico. My job is to introduce a bunch of people, so if you would just hold your applause, I'd appreciate it. We can get on to the more substantive parts of the program. Um, you know, New Mexico First is one of those or unique organizations in New Mexico where we bring uh, a lot of people together with disparate views to try to reach consensus on issues important to the state. And obviously water is incredibly important to all of us. I grew up in Albuquerque and I was one of those kids who heard over and over again, don't worry, there's a ton of water uh, in our, our groundwater that will support a huge population and we don't have to worry about water for the future. We know that that is not true. And so what you're going to be doing over the next two days is incredibly important. As uh, the board chair, I want to commit on behalf of our board of directors that we will do everything practicable to uh, implement the recommendations, the consensus recommendations that come out of the town hall tomorrow afternoon. Um, we have several board members who are here today. We are a statewide board, 33 strong. Um, and so I would ask the board members emeritus as well as uh, serving currently, if you'd please stand and hold your applause. Thank you, that was a quick stand, Kurt. <laughs> um, we also have several members of our research committee who are here today. The research committee is an incredibly important part of the town hall. They're the ones who put together the background report for you. And so if the research committee uh, would please stand. Thank you very much for your contributions to this effort. Last but not least, um, uh, putting a town hall together requires a lot of effort on the part of staff as well as our sponsors. It is not easy to do. And so I would like to personally thank uh, our lead sponsors, the, How the Hatton Sumners Foundation and Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, all the t town hall donors are listed in the program, so you can refer to the program for the, for the entire uh, a group of entities that have uh, sponsored the town hall, and thank you very much. Um, now that we've man I've managed to introduce everybody, you can clap for everyone who's here. <laughs> Before I turn the uh, program over to Heather Ballas, the uh, president of, the, of New Mexico First, I just wanted to say something about the backgrounder report. That report um, is what we pr 
try to we produce for every town hall is to give people who are technically competent as well as people being introduced to the issue some idea of the the nature of the beast the issues that they will be tackling but it's not intended to be the end all it is intended to be a starting point this is a difficult um, effort to put together in a way that's thoughtful and yet readable so I hope you will view the background report for what it is, a starting point, and that you will build on it in your deliberations. We know that lots of you think that there were things that are missing from it or maybe should have been stated in a different way. And if the research committee, had, you had been on the research committee, um, I'm sure that would have happened uh, when you de dealt with it. But if you will just treat it the way that I'm suggesting, that it's um, a starting point, not an end point, um, then um, everyone can come together in the way that we intend. So let me turn it over to Heather. Thank you very much again for coming. We appreciate it. Good morning. So thank you all so much for being here. What I'd like to do is just quickly um, remind those of you who don't know a little bit about the work of New Mexico First. Um, can I get a show of hands? How many of you have been through a New Mexico First deliberation in the past? Hey, you rock. Thank you so much for coming back. Um, we would like to um, remind you, for those of you that haven't been through um, one of our processes before, that we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We were co founded by Senators Domenici and Bingaman to engage the people of New Mexico in the democratic process. And a lot of people ask, you know, why do we do what we do? And it's because we believe that lawmakers will make better choices about the future of our state that they will make better choices every single time when they are thoughtfully informed by informed citizens. And so many of you are going to be developing recommendations over the next few days, and we know that there are a lot of lawmakers in the room and a lot of lawmakers watching for the report after it's released who are excited to hear what you have to suggest. Um, I also know that, that you all are, we're all on the same page on, in terms of being people who wake up every morning thinking, what can I do to make New Mexico better today? And I'm going to tell you that every member of my staff does that. Every single day we wake up and think, what are we doing today that's strengthening our state? And the thing is that what I know is a whole bunch of you, at least today, woke up with that exact same question. Um, and you also probably woke up thinking, Okay, so who else is going to be at this event today? So in addition to what can we do to make New Mexico better, let's take a quick look at who you're going to be working with when you t work on that over the next two days. So we've got, you'll see from this slide that we have a very, very diverse um, set of citizens here. Um, we've got the education sector in terms of our researchers and students. We have um, the business sector represented, nonprofits, which include environmental advocates, um, state government, um, uh, state and local government uh, individuals, um, and uh, tribal representatives, and as I said, a fair number of students. So we're very pleased by this uh, particular pie chart, and we're really, really thrilled, as Jennifer noted, that we have 31 of New Mexico's 33, 33 counties represented here today. Jennifer, uh, and, and so when you look at these, you're going to see that um, within the business sector, there's also um, a fair number of farmers and ranchers in the room, and we know that that's an important sector given um, water ag use. So that's the other piece we wanted you to know. Now, um, Jennifer mentioned that this is our 40th statewide town hall, and what we want you to know is that past town halls have made significant impacts or contributed to significant impacts in New Mexico. So some of the policy changes that have come out of past statewide town halls, like the one you're at today, include the advancement of state and regional water planning, the expansion of federal Medicaid, enactment of renewable energy tax credits, the creation of the New Mexico Tax Research Institute, and a slew of other items that are on our fact sheet that are on the table outside. We're going to tee up a few others of those as the event goes on, but we wanted to remind you that you're working today um, in, with a process that has a track record for making a difference in our state. So that said, we know in the next two days we'll see what you all come up with, and no doubt it will be brilliant. 
We're going to talk more about the process used to harvest that brilliance in a few minutes. But first, I um, would like to welcome our first speaker of the day, which is um, Senator Martin Heinrich. Senator Heinrich and Senator Tom Udall both serve as honorary co-chairs of New Mexico First, their involvement stemming from the tradition of the organization being established by New Mexico's two U.S. Senators. So Senator Heinrich, as you know, is a strong advocate for water issues. Elected in 2012, the Senator serves on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, among others. He helps us look after our water interest in a number of ways, including championing the Navajo Gallup Water Project, supporting farmers and ranchers of eastern New Mexico via the Ute Pipeline, and advocating sensible environmental protections for our most vital natural resource. Please welcome Senator Martin Heinrich. Well, thank you, Heather, for that introduction, and I want to thank Heather and Jennifer and all of you who are board members or volunteers for New Mexico First uh, for making this possible, and all of you who are joining us because you care about New Mexico's water future. When you look around this room, you realize um, this idea of New Mexico First, of bringing people together to talk about these issues and to come up with recommendations is every bit as salient and critical as it was when this organization was started uh, by Senator Domenici and Senator Bingaman. So thank you for being here today. It's an incredibly important discussion, and I think the conversations that New Mexico First have are critical because they allow us to hear the diverse voices from communities throughout the state. And you're going to be informing us about how we tackle uh, these very challenging uh, water challenges that we face. We all know that without enough available clean water, our overall health as a state suffers. Our environment, our economy, our population all feel those pressures. And we need to develop policies that integrate energy and water solutions, which will become increasingly vital as our population grows. And we must work together to address our environmental needs as a changing climate continues to impact our nation's energy and water resources and our natural resources throughout the state of New Mexico. The Secure Water Amendments Act is one proposal I'm proud to support to help address the ongoing drought that we face today. Obviously, it's taken a very heavy toll on our state from north to south, and this bill will help provide New Mexico with resources to plan for and combat drought and to assist in developing a comprehensive strategy. Expanding funding for projects that conserve and use water more efficient, efficiently will help create much needed long-term solutions to save water and money in our communities suffering from the impacts of drought and lack of water supply. That's just one example of uh, a piece of policy and what I hope to see after the next few days is an action item list that we can take back to Washington and really get to work on. One of the issues that you all can address in today's discussion is how to strengthen watershed management both before and after wildfires. Large crown fires pollute rivers which feed into municipal water supplies. So when forests burn, downstream communities have to deal with the ash and sediment in their drinking water. And farmers are faced with river water too contaminated to be used for irrigation. We know that even once a fire is out, and some of our tribal colleagues here can tell you about this from some of the recent fires, the impacts don't just go on for months, they go on for years. All of us, federal, state, local, tribal landowners, the utilities and the private sector all need to work together to protect our critical water supplies and the watersheds that create those supplies. There's no single solution that's going to address all of our water needs, which is why today is so important. Addressing our water issues will take collaborative efforts based on collective ideas, including using new technology paired with traditional conservation and efficiency. Even as technological solutions like desalinization continue to improve, we have to keep up the hard work of using the water we have now ever more efficiently. In a climate like ours, conservation will always need to be part of the solution. 
Recently, I participated in an all-night discussion on the Senate floor to raise awareness of the devastating effects of climate change, in particular its impact on our water supply here in the Southwest. There's no doubt that we are seeing bigger fires, we're seeing drier summers, we're seeing more severe floods when it does finally rain, and less snowpack in the winter. In 2012 here in New Mexico, we experienced the hottest year on record. And the reality is things are only going to get more challenging if we do nothing. If we have any hope of reversing the effects of climate change, and we must, it's critical that we embrace this challenge now and lead the world in innovation, efficiency, and clean energy. Whether for our national security, our energy independence, or our nation's ability to compete in the global economy, our efforts and our solutions should be rooted in fact and driven by the best available science. Now the best ideas to help address our water challenges come from the community. They come from all of you. And all of us represent different sectors from industry, municipalities, businesses, tribes, labs, or community organizations. All of us have to work together to balance a very wide range of needs. I look forward to looking at your recommendations on how best we can address our water challenges together. And I can guarantee you that Senator Udall and I will take those recommendations to Washington, D.C. I truly value your input, and I would ask that today is just the beginning of this conversation, because water is truly New Mexico's future. And I want to thank each and every one of you for taking ownership of New Mexico's water future. Thank you. Jennifer, I know we're trying to hold applause, but let's do another round of applause for our great senator. <laughs> senator Heinrich, uh, thank you for being here this morning. Um, you've given us a lot to think about, and um, we're especially appreciative that you're willing to take what we come up with uh, today and tomorrow and, and look at it and think about how it impacts New Mexico, but also impacts our country and impacts the world. And Senator, since I share an office with uh, the Mars Rover team, I know that water is also an issue uh, beyond the globe, so it's an important issue for all of us. Um, our other senator, co-sponsor of, uh, of New Mexico First, um, Senator Udall, is not here this morning. He's in Washington. And he brought and prepared uh, a videotape for us to watch. So let's watch that videotape. Hi everyone, Tom Udall here. It's my honor to represent New Mexico in the United States Senate. As an honorary co-chair of New Mexico First, I'm pleased to support your work on water planning and development. All of you in this room know the challenges we face. New Mexico's drought is the worst in a century, and projections for the Southwest indicate hotter and drier conditions. While we can't make it rain, we can improve our response to water shortages. That's why this town hall is so important. Our drought is a shared challenge, and it requires shared solutions. From farmers, ranchers, business leaders, and expert water planners, this also includes cities, states, and the federal government. As a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, I'm working to promote water conservation and fighting to ensure New Mexico has the resources it needs to respond to the drought. Last year, my office released a comprehensive water conference report with 40 recommendations on dealing with our water scarcity. Since that time, I've been working to implement these recommendations and help our communities access resources to use water more efficiently. Recently, I helped secure 19 million in water smart funding for water conservation and drought projects that help local governments, tribes, and irrigation districts conserve water. I've also introduced a bill called the Smart Water Act to help states, water utilities, and consumers install technology that detects leaks so that they can get the most out of every drop. 
Another bill I'm working to pass is the Innovative Stormwater Infrastructure Act. This would help communities in New Mexico relieve pressure on aging infrastructure and control flooding, all while creating jobs through public-private partnerships. These are just a few of the things I'm working on at the federal level. But your expertise on the ground is needed now more than ever. Policy is best shaped on the shoulders of experts, consumers, and others impacted every day by water. And in order to meet our water challenges, we need all hands on deck. Organizations like New Mexico First have championed water planning for many years. And I applaud your effort to bring people together through bipartisan and creative approaches. I also appreciate the work of our national laboratories, private entities, and government leaders who are stepping forward. We need your wisdom and your leadership now more than ever. I want to close by thanking everyone in this room for taking the time to address one of the most important challenges facing our state. I'm anxious to hear more about the accomplishments you've made during this conference, and I look forward to working with you on advancing New Mexico's water future. Cheers. Have a good day. Take care. So we thank Senator Udall for that, um, that message, and we also uh, want to make sure that you all know that we have um, staff representatives from both Senator Udall and Senator Heinrich's offices with us throughout the town hall. Now, the next thing we're going to do is I'm going to ask my um, roundtable discussion leaders, if you all, or discussion members, if you would start coming forward and take seats up here in the front. And while the speakers are coming up, we're going to do a quick little um, pop quiz with those of you in the audience. We know that most of you read the background report and we're tickled by that. And we um, are asking you, in the middle of each table, there's a gift bag. Inside that gift bag are some electronic polling devices. For the remainder of this town hall, we're going to affectionately refer to those things as the clickers. And this is our first chance to make use of them. So pass those around. And um, we have a, a few questions that we're going to offer up as we um, start the roundtable discussion. And then we'll um, use these again uh, a couple times during the town hall. So while you're doing that, Let's tee up the first question, Melanie. OK. So I'm going to tell you, those little clickers, it takes rocket science to use them. Um, you've got, in this first example, two choices, true or false. One is true, two is false. You're going to click a one if you think that's the answer. Two, the otherwise. You don't have to hit enter or anything else. Um, and there's a timer that'll appear in the bottom that'll show us how long we've got. How much time did we give them for this, each question? OK. So you have 10 seconds to answer most of these, and you're going to find out it's not going to take you anywhere near that long. So our first question, in the last 20 years, the New Mexico population has increased from 1.6 million to 2.1 million. That's a 31% increase in our state's population. So here's your true-false question. During that time, our use of water, has, it's increased by about the same amount. Is that true or false? I hear a bunch of you muttering the right answer, which is a good sign. All right, so the majority of you know the answer to that question is, in fact, false. Instead, the correct answer is that our water withdrawals actually decreased by about 14%, at least in terms of measured withdrawals, um, during exactly the time that our population was increasing. So that says that there are ways for us to think about water use in thoughtful ways um, as we move forward. Now, that said, let's look at the next question up. Um, 
we know that there is a significant Im impact and in, in, uh, intersection between forest fires and watershed management and um, downstream municipal water use. So we have a section of the report that talks about fires. And this question is um, large uncontrolled fires, especially those in northern New Mexico, or any watershed for that matter, directly affect which of the following? We've got a list for you here, and it's either one of these things, all of these things, or some of these things. The items that we've got listed include river and stream water in the immediate area of the fire, endangered species or other wildlife, municipal water supplies that are even hundreds of miles away, state economy, local economy, food production. What do y'all think? One of those, all of those, some of those. Uh, oh, they're, are they not numbered? One through eight? So they're in the order that they are. If you think it's some... So the good news is, despite the fact we had clicker confusion, um, the majority of the room, in fact, did it. So uh, we do have the right answer displayed as all of the above. And what I don't know is how many of you got to vote. So for those of you that didn't, we apologize. Sorry that, that the numbers were a little bit light. Um, but we do know that, in fact, uh, forest fires affect water in all these different ways and our economy in all these different ways. We've got two more of these before we start our discussion and the next one up is, oh sorry, I had a little factoid of four million acres of forested land burning in New Mexico in the last five years. So there are very serious reasons for us to think about that question. Okay, next up is an agricultural question. Agriculture accounts for the highest percentage of water withdrawals of all industries in New Mexico. Is this industry's water use declining, staying the same, or increasing? What do y'all think? And if the numbers are light, it's one, two, and three. You all say declining, and the correct answer is Yes, declining. Um, and the um, industry itself, um, from its economic standpoint, continues to grow, but water use is declining. Next up, at least in terms of measured water use. Next up, brackish water. We know that we um, have an estimated 15 billion acre feet of brackish water under the surface. Of that, roughly what percentage has a low enough salinity that we could potentially use it, either for ag or municipal? Almost half of you in the room say we don't know, and that is, in fact, what is the case. It is our understanding that we don't know. And that's one of the things that you all will be talking about um, as we move into the next session. We have a group that will be working on brackish water um, policy and produced water policy. And here's one of the things they'll think about. So having said all of that, we're going to move to our roundtable discussion. You'll give me a second to switch places. Thank you, gentlemen. You guys want to pass this back? So before we get started with these speakers who have been kind enough to help us set the stage for the town hall, I want to let you know that when we introduced dignitaries at the beginning of the event, um, we missed one. Representative um, George Dodge is here and we didn't have him on the list, so Representative Dodge, thank you so much for joining us. Um, So with me on the stage, we've got um, Dave Martin, who is the Secretary of Energy, Minerals, Natural Resources, um, Jeff Witte, who's our Secretary of Agriculture here in New Mexico, Governor Richard Luarki with Laguna Pueblo, um, Ryan Flynn with the Department of Environment, and uh, Laura McCarthy with the Nature Conservancy. So because we've got a lot to do, we're not going to do um, detailed bios on each of these folks. We're going to try to be clever, and their bios are going to appear on the big screen the first or second time that 
that they talk. So keep an eye on the screen as we move through to learn more about these folks. Um, and then what I'd like us to do is start right, right away thinking about how we're going to work together as a state, um, role modeling that here in this town hall today. So Governor Lorarkey, we're going to start with you. And um, you know, we often talk about water in New Mexico in terms of ownership, but you have an interesting perspective in terms of is it my water or your water, or does that matter? What do you think? Thank you, Heather, for allowing the Pueblo of Laguna to be here today and, and participate. And good morning to all of you and the uh, distinguished uh, guests or individuals that I'm uh, sitting here with. You know, for the Pueblo of Laguna and the way I think we look at things, and I think all of us as a state of New Mexico, water impacts all of us, tribal or not, farmer or not, livestock grower or not, it impacts all of us. One of the things that I, th I see that is so very critical is we're in this whole conversation and dialogue about water rights, my water, but we really need to take that my and I out of the equation and think about it in terms of our water. We need to have an integrated approach as opposed to a segregated approach. And I think if we can do that, we begin to see the strength and, and, and the value of New Mexico as a whole because we have integration as opposed to segregation and how we look at our, our water. None of us own it, but we have a responsibility to it. It's not water rights, it's water responsibility. And so that's, that's how I see us looking at this whole, this larger issue of, of water responsibility. So what do you think are the biggest barriers to working in a collaborative way in terms of water as a shared responsibility? In my mind, I, I think one of the biggest barriers has been just that individualism that it's mine. It's my, you know, and once we, we can break away from that, um, it, it begins to break down those barriers and, and begins to move us towards that conversation and that, that model of true collaboration and true um, collectiveness in, in, in addressing these issues. Very good. Any of the rest of you want to weigh in on that? What do you see as the barriers to collaboration? All right. The, the silence is deafening, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, in a state like New Mexico where water is a finite resource and, and we have a long history of water use, it, and you start looking at the different competing uses and, and as we're going through uh, adjudications, as we're going through population growth, as we're going through dynamic changes in, in rainfall and, and everything else, it all adds to it. And, and I think when you get back to the uncertainty of, of what's out there and what can be used or what kinds of supplies you've got, uh, We've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. Well, some of those challenges, including um, addressing the very issues you're talking about, as well as collaborating, aren't just challenges in terms of what we have happening on the state level, but they're also on federal manners. We, we know that 40% um, roughly of New Mexico is federally owned, and there are many water and land management issues associated with all of that acreage. One of the best examples of that, of that challenge is um, watershed management, and uh, that's especially in forested areas, as we mentioned in the, in the slide before we started. So we're going to talk about watersheds for a few minutes, and Ms. McCarthy, we're going to start with you. So we tend to think about water storage as being something we do in reservoirs or in storage tanks or even in aquifers, but you talk about the mountains as a storage tower. What does that mean? If you think about the fact that 75% of water in the West actually originates as mountain snowpack, you can see how forested mountains where most of the snowpack falls can serve as a water tower. Those forests are providing shade for the snowpack so that it lasts longer into the spring. And it's really a benefit to, to our state to have watersheds that are functioning properly. Unfortunately, right now, we have a situation where there have been substantial changes to our forests over the last 
80 years so that they're no longer functioning as the water towers that we need them to be. And those changes are both in the storage and the release function. So from a storage perspective, when you have an overgrown forest, that means that every time we get a snowfall, not enough of it reaches the ground. It gets hung up in that closed canopy of treetops where it sublimates before it ever enters our water cycle. Or you can also think of that overgrown forest as a collection of straws up on the mountaintop. So every time, every summer when when the trees are transpiring, they're actually pulling water out of the ground and into the atmosphere. Again, water that's not reaching our streams. And then there's the wildfire factor, which has already been mentioned, which does a number of things. First is the fire itself, which burns really hot because the trees are so close together. Then you end up with severe severe burned areas where there's nothing left on the ground except for ash, then you get monsoon rains. And when the rain comes and there's nothing to intercept it, another healthy watershed function, you get debris flows, which many of our communities have experienced disruptions to their water supplies and infrastructure. And then finally, there's the lasting impact of burn scars on our land, as, as was mentioned, with the four million acres over five years. And those are now lands where the storage function is completely disrupted because the snowpack really sublimates on the exposed areas of a burn scar, and there are no trees to shade it into the spring. So what do you see as the challenges in terms of federal, um, let's do federal first, um, federal integration as it relates to addressing some of those issues? Well, we're, we're in an interesting situation where the majority of the forested watersheds are owned by the federal government or held by the, the federal government in the public trust. And um, that's where the majority of the work needs to take place. Unfortunately, uh, we're the downstream users, and that means that we have to live with the consequences. So the challenge from a coordination perspective is really to get all of our various levels of government, federal, state, local, tribal, and private interests that have a stake in this, either as water users or as businesses that can be a part of the solution and, and create jobs as part of the solution, get everybody working together on the same page. Because right now, what we have is some investment, but it's scattered all throughout New Mexico's watersheds. It's not coordinated in a way that enables us to get up to a significant scale. Because we have fires that burn, in the case of Las Conchas and Whitewater Baldy, they both had single day spreads of 40,000 acres. So for treating a few thousand here and there, it's pretty much ineffective. That coordination is extraordinarily difficult to accomplish and it takes setting aside of personal interest in order to work toward that common goal of large landscape watershed restoration for our future water supplies. So there's one example of a federal um, state or federal local, federal tribal integration that matters as it relates to water. Are there others? Secretary Martin. Thank you, Heather. Well, to, to build on what Laura said, uh, our department has the forestry division and um, we uh, prioritize the watershed issues around the state. And I think the, the federal government, as was mentioned, uh, uh, mainly the U.S. Forest Service oversees about half of the watershed and forest areas, uh, they could do a better job of prioritizing and, and applying uh, resources. Now, uh, Laura mentioned that uh, the resources aren't sufficient. Uh, we were successful this last legislative session in getting $6.2 million uh, for watershed issues through our forestry division. It wasn't uh, quite as much as we requested, but it was a real positive step in the right direction because it was the most that we'd ever received in that area. And, and I think when we, when we talk about challenges, you know, one challenge the federal government has are budgets. And 
this may be an opportunity for us, and I'll, I'll just point out a couple of examples, not in this area, but in some other areas that we've worked with the federal government. We've worked with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, Federal Indian Minerals Office, on, on trying to help them uh, do things more effectively. We, j we have a memorandum of agreement with them. We just recently signed a memorandum of understanding with the Bureau of Land Management because they have funding issues and staffing issues so we're, we're, uh, they're prioritizing their needs, we are prioritizing our needs in our field offices, and we're going to work together and, and, and work with some of our uh, universities, a consortium of universities, to see how they may be able to help us address some of our needs. So I think, you know, when we, it, when we look to try to change policy, sometimes, especially with the federal government, that's pretty difficult. But there may be opportunities where we can do some sort of a pilot project and if that's successful, then I think the policymakers can see that, that maybe some policy changes could be made that would benefit all of us, whether it's federal, whether it's state, whether it's local. In the recent Farm Bill, uh, there's uh, information in there that encourages uh, the federal government to work more with communities. And I think, as Laura mentioned, you know, all of us can't uh, just retreat in our area. We need to work together with, with the federal, with the state, with the tribal, with the, with the local communities. Uh, to make sure that uh, we're addressing the needs properly. I, th I think there's also another example of a lowland watershed restoration project, the Restore New Mexico project through the BLM, partnering with the Soil and Water Conservation Districts. They've restored over, uh, I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but over a million acres of, of land that the BLM controls, and you're seeing significant improvements in the, you know, the watershed in those areas as well. So there's, there's a local uh, federal st state uh, partnership there that's, that's success. The Forest Service has got other challenges with all the regulations that they're, you know, they're behind in their NEPA analysis in a lot of cases and, and that really slows them down and being able to go in and, and take care of the watersheds like they need to and uh, at some point in time those issues have got to be addressed as well. Do we have any others that we want to jump on on that before I go to a new topic? Okay, then we are going to switch to water quality. And uh, the New Mexico Environment Department has authority over water quality issues. Um, and those issues often overlap with watershed issues, especially as they relate to the quality of river water in particular. So Secretary Flynn, some people in this room worked really hard on legislation in the last session um, that passed the River Stewardship Initiative. Can you talk for just a couple minutes about how this new law is going to um, influence the work of your agency? And related to that, if there's any um, things that, are, that your agency is working on related to that that this group could advise you on. Well, uh, hello? There we go. Is it working? Yeah? No? Speak. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, the, yes, there are a lot of people in the room that uh, did help out to get the River Stewards Initiative passed. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I need to acknowledge the work of uh, a couple NGOs like the Audubon Society, which did an outstanding job helping to advocate for the program. Also, have to acknowledge the work of. Uh, We're going to trade you again. Yeah. Well, the uh, the River Stewards Initiative was a, a success from the last legislative session. Really appreciate and want to thank some of the NGOs, in particular the Audubon Society, for their advocacy in helping push that initiative forward. Uh, would have to also, of course, thank the legislature for working with Governor Martinez in order to make it happen. Uh, in particular, uh, Senator Griego and Senator Cisneros really stepped up and, um, and, and made the program a, a success. Uh, the River Stewards Initiative, it, it's a small piece, but it's a, it's a start to address a critical problem we have in the state in that uh, over a third of our rivers and streams are currently not meeting water quality standards. So we have approximately a third of our river, our freshwater resources are impaired in the state. And the goal of this initiative is to improve water quality in, uh, in our freshwater resources, our rivers and streams throughout the state of New Mexico. And we have challenges that uh, have, have brought us here. Uh, obviously with uh, decreasing snowpack, uh, impacts of climate change, lower, uh, lower stream flows have an impact on water quality. Uh, wildfires that we've experienced over the past couple of years also certainly have a major impact on water quality. And then we have a number of non-point sources which are also contribute to the degradation of water quality throughout the state. Uh, I think the initiative that we're 
going to focus on with the River Stewards. It, it's an opportunity for communities to come together and to really take ownership of their resources. And, and that's why I think this project really will be successful. It's not a top-down, state-driven initiative. We work with, we, we issue an RFP, and we are uh, planning to do that in, uh, in June. And through that process, we receive proposals from communities. And that's what I think the key of this project is, is that you get people who live in the community who decide that we're going to come together, we're going to work with the local government, we're going to work with NGOs, and we're going to work with citizens, and we're going to do something about a problem that is right in our backyard. And so they really take ownership and drive this process. And so I think that kind of bottom-up approach where you have members, local citizens, really taking ownership of projects and doing the hard work in order to make it successful is one of the things about the River Stewards Initiative that really excites me and uh, I know excited Governor Martinez when we first spoke about it. If you've spent a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears actually improving water quality in your community, it becomes much more difficult to walk away from that, that investment uh, two or three years down the line when the project is complete. You'll have, you have skin in the game, so to speak, and you'll be more likely to continue to maintain that resource uh, in years ahead. Uh, as we look on developing criteria for projects, I mean, I think we, our approach as a state is really just to, to again, utilize a, a bottom-up approach and defer to communities to identify their priorities in their areas. And, and we're not going to be uh, identifying certain areas as being the top areas. Uh, we want to receive all the good projects we can get. I think certainly when we're dealing with any type of uh, allocation of state resources, we need to think in terms of, of risk. And uh, in, that, in that regard, I would, I would think if we were evaluating a number of competing proposals, we would really want to focus on the areas that are, are most impaired uh, being the priority. But um, so short, of, short of that uh, criteria, I would probably defer because, again, I really don't want to limit proposals. I want to get as many proposals as we can get so that uh, we spend all that money as quickly as possible and, uh, and go back to the legislature and ask for more. <laughs> okay, so let's circle for just a second. So those are some examples of some work that's happening on river water quality. We've, had, we've got some people in the room that are concerned about aquifer water quality and aquifer contamination. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, sure. I uh, probably could spend the next hour and a half talking about that. We have, uh, we have 14 active Superfund sites in the state of New Mexico. We have a couple of very high profile uh, contamination issues, uh, most notably Kirtland Air Force Base, the bulk fuel spill right here in, uh, in Albuquerque. We also have uh, chromium contamination and RDX contamination up in Los Alamos. Um, as I mentioned, we have a number of, uh, of rivers and streams, over a third, that are impaired in the state. Uh, so we have freshwater challenges, and we certainly have a number of challenges for our groundwater resources. Uh, I think that we're making some really good progress on a couple of those issues, um, but there's, there's two issues, one large and another one that is, uh, it's not, I'm not going to say it's small, but it's, it's a much lower profile. Uh, the first is we've really struggled with successfully remediating the legacy uh, contamination associated with uh, uranium sites in the Grants Mining District. And there's been, we've, we've, we've had fits uh, of activity, but we haven't, um, we haven't done nearly enough in that regard to really address the legacy contamination associated with uh, uranium mines in the Grants Mining District. So I think that's one area where uh, where we really, uh, and, and when I say we, I don't mean the state, I mean us all. This is, there's, there's a lot of federal issues um, and federal ownership of lands uh, in that area, and uh, this is an area where EPA came up with a five-year plan a couple of years ago in consultation with the state of New Mexico and with uh, some of the sovereign nations in the area, including uh, Laguna Pueblo and uh, Acoma Pueblo and the Navajo Nation. Um, but and we came up with this five-year plan, and uh, we started doing some of the work, and then the funding petered out. And we really, we really need to, to, to do something. We need to do more in order to address that issue. And, and a lot of it comes down to funding. Um, uh, and I, but I, I don't know, um, 
I don't know exactly how we're going to get more funding, but it's, it's an area where there's, there's agreement among the federal government, the state government, and I believe among the sovereign nations uh, that something needs to done, be done and not nearly enough has been done. And uh, I think there's a tremendous opportunity there. The, the second issue is the could less... We, could we jump in for one second? Sure. Governor Larkey, you want to jump in on the uranium piece? Sure. Um, thank you, um, Secretary Flynn, for you know, what he shared. I, I think that's really, really critical. Um, Laguna has experienced firsthand um, the effects of the uranium mining. Uh, you know, we re most recently, the Anaconda uranium area that was at one time the largest open pit mine in the world was recently designated as a Superfund site. And, you know, but we continue to feel the impact of, of um, uh, those operations on the water. Um, as a matter of fact, one of, one of our villages downstream, um, they, they can't do any more farming because that's, that was the resource uh, for water um, into that area. So they can't do anything because it's all contaminated. And so it's just an incredible impact that, that it has on communities and, and health-wise as well. What we're seeing most recently, the um, application for licensure up in the Mount Taylor area um, from mines like, like uh, the most recent uh, Roca Honda and the uh, Mount Taylor and, and, and those groups that will be, in particular the Roca Honda, that will be pulling an incredible amount of water out of that area, you know, if it goes through. And so, um, but it, at the end of the day, to what Secretary Flynn's talking about, what does that impact to the community? Because if you have no water, you don't have anything. End of story, you know, um, and it, it impacts not only our Pueblo, but from Milan to Grants to Acoma to Laguna, all down that whole valley. And so it, it's, it's an incredible challenge that we have. And, you know, Laguna is, is one that is where we're in favor of economic development, um, adamantly in favor of economic development, but it has to be done right and it has to be done safe and it has to be done for the benefit of the majority. And so I really appreciate what he's saying because without water, no economic development can happen. So appreciate the comments. Secretary Flynn, you were starting to go into a second point. Sure. So why don't we jump back to you on that? Thank you, Governor. Thanks. Uh, the, the, the second issue, uh, it's not a very, uh, it's not a sexy issue. Uh, we talk about cesspools around the state and liquid waste. Uh, it's, it's people, a lot of, uh, you know, Political types don't get excited to take a picture in front of a, uh, a liquid waste system, but it's a it's a real issue, and uh, it's it's a third world issue that we that we're facing right in our backyard. We had a, a, a infant drown uh, a couple years ago up near Espanola um, because uh, she wandered into a cesspool, and uh, and these are these this is just these are not problems that should occur anywhere in the world, um, but you know we're focusing on New Mexico issues, and right in our backyard, we have, we have far too many illegal cesspools and malfunctioning liquid waste systems. And um, uh, hopefully th uh, there's been a safe buffer between when you ate the breakfast and now, but uh, and I'm not going to go into much detail, but there are, are very major environmental and public health is issues associated with uh, improper or uh, malfunctioning liquid waste systems. And these, this is a problem that I think is low-hanging fruit. Uh, it, it's not a lot of, it, it, it doesn't cost a lot of money in order to replace these systems. I mean, it, it, and, and it, relatively speaking, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to be, uh, to, to minimize, you know, spending 7,500 bucks on a new liquid waste tr uh, treatment system is a significant expense for, for, for a lot of families in our state, and I recognize that. But in the grand scheme of things, uh, you know, if you could allocate half a million or a million dollars toward addressing that, that issue, you could have a real huge impact uh, on a statewide level. And we've, we've had legislation in the past that created uh, a fund, uh, an indigent assistance fund, to address this problem. But uh, we were in the throes, when this legislation was enacted, we were in the throes of economic crisis, and it was that, that fund was never actually funded. So we, have a, we, ha we actually have the, the vehicle right now in our state statutes. It wouldn't require any new legislation. We just haven't been able to fund it. And, and, I, and it's, it's designed for indigent, the, the legislation that was created really is designed to assist indigent communities and, and, and families because that's where we predominantly are, are seeing this problem. It's not, it's not occurring in our more affluent communities around the state. It's, it's, it's occurring in the poorer communities around the state. And, and you know, I, I think that's an issue that it's low-hanging fruit. It would have a huge public health impact, 
and it's something that, um, that we should do. Thank you. Uh, I think, um, given time, we should shift gears for a second, and let's talk on a totally different topic on agriculture. Um, we know that industrially, agriculture is the largest water user. Um, uh, farmers are quick to point out, however, that the water that they withdraw from the system goes back into it via return flows, via river flows, via groundwater recharge. Um, and so we know that um, that farmers are using water, and much of that water is being used to grow our crops. Much of that water is um, supporting watersheds and other economic purposes. Um, and we know that when we think about water policy, we instantly in New Mexico start thinking about agricultural policy. So let's talk for just a second. Um, Secretary Witte, the backgrounder, showed that the um, ag sector has, um, uh, water use has declined, but that the industry itself is growing. How do we explain that? Our farmers are good. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and in a way, that's exactly true. Um, and in another way, you've got to, uh, there's a couple things happening here. Our farmers, we've been under a, a severe drought for a number of years now, four or five. New Mexico's typically a dry state anyway. And when you start thinking about, we had a drought task force meeting in Artesia last week, and, and we had a report from our state climatologist, and, and I'm you know, it got to the point where I kind of hate hearing from Dave when he comes because he's never talking about good things. But overall, in the last four years, the state, across the state of New Mexico, we're down in precipitation anywhere from 10 to 19 inches across the state of New Mexico. So when you think about that on a, on a perspective of why we're using less water in agriculture, think about this. The state of New Mexico has almost 78 million acres in the state. And when you're down, I'll do Aggie math, Aggie math says we're down an average a foot. It's more than that, but it just Aggie math is simple. A foot. So over the last four years or so, we're down almost 78 million acre feet of precipitation. So think about that and what the landscape looks like and why it's so dry when you have taken away 78 million acre feet of water out of our system. And on average, we use 3.8 million, and agriculture uses around 3.4 or something, according to your report. Our farmers have had to look at conservation measures. They, they, they do a great job of, of laser leveling the land or putting in drip systems or lining ditches or, or whatever. But the other thing that they've done, if you drive across the state, you see areas of followed land. They've had to let land lay out. And, and use what minimal water they've had on a very limited number of acres. So there's less water use because it's just not available. But conservation measures, limited water, and you look at the, the dynamics of, of our state, we have the most diverse set of agriculturalists, the mi most diverse set of uh, production of any, any state in the nation. And, and that's a tribute to the folks that are sitting in this room and, and others across the state that are growing. And, and I don't view agriculture using water. I view farmers and ranchers making water nutritious. <laughs> to get that, farmers and ranchers making water nutritious. You know, when, when you eat that stuff that's on your plate, that's taking water to get it there. And so we're really talking about food policy when you talk about agriculture water use. When we talk about agricultural use, we're also talking about economic development or, to use your term, Governor Lamarckie, economic creation. So when you and I talked before um, this meeting, you mentioned some of your um, thoughts on agricultural um, economic creation as it relates to um, ag activity on, on tribal lands. Do you want to raise anything on that before we switch topics? Well, you know, I, I think for, for tribes, um, they have many of the same challenges that everybody else has, you know, and, and I just, I think that um, it's going to be really critical that we look at ways of doing better conservation of water, better usage, better um, ways of, of managing our lands um, as it relates to agriculture, um, reintroducing some of the, the activities as it relates to agriculture. Um, you know, growing up there in the Pueblo, my grandfather had um, sheep. So I grew up in that environment of, you know, going out to have to herd sheep in the summers and, you know, he had alfalfa and um, doing those kind of things. So um, I, I just think it's a, it's a really critical piece that we need to reintroduce or we don't see a lot of our young people doing it anymore. 
uh, the population doing the, the um, 